Good to see everyone out this morning. Uh, we're blessed to be here, folks. I, I feel blessed to be here. Amen. Man, I hope you do. Uh, Brother John Barnhart, would you lead us in prayer, please? Folks, the Lord's our friend, amen? He's a friend of sinners, and I'm a sinner, and I need his grace. I've been saved, but I'm still a sinner, amen? If you would, stand and get your All-American Church hymnal. Turn to page number 186, no, not one.
Amen, amen. The Bible calls him the friend of sinners. I'm glad he's my friend, aren't you? Amen. We'd like to welcome you to Temple this morning. If you're here first time, would you raise your hand and we'll give you a card and let you fill it out, drop the plate and it passes in a moment. There are some folks over here. Make yourself at home. Good to have you. Anybody else first time today? All right. Where are you folks from over here? Good. All right. Amen. Amen. Good to have you. Good to have you. All right. We'll meet again soon at 6 o'clock for the evening service, Lord willing. And late, we'd like to invite you back. I don't know about you, but God's been good to me. Amen. 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 Here you go. like to invite the choir up. We'll sing out of the All-American Church Hymnal, page 47. I would not be denied. All that will come up and sing. Fister, you can come also. church folks. Isn't that something? These little kids, man, they come up and sing as unto the Lord, folks. No guile within them, folks. If we could be more like a child, boy, we could have us a service. Amen. stand again, get your All-American Church hymnal, turn to page number 306, My Jesus, I Love Thee.
seated as the choir comes down. miss that you miss something amen let's have the ushers come up and take up the morning offering <clears throat> train up a child in the way it should go folks amen. the world wants them boy do they ever want them our father we have nothing to give you that you haven't already given to us nothing absolutely nothing we thank you and bless your righteous name this morning. Our Heavenly Father, may your word go forth for the purpose you intended. God, use this, use this creature of clay this morning. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.
good. Vernon McLeod going to sing for us this morning. That's a good old song, folks. That's good. My God is real. He's the only absolute reality there is. Because he existed before all creation. Turn to the book of Luke chapter 18 this morning, please. Luke chapter 18. Verse number 9. Luke chapter 18 and verse number 9. The scripture says, And he spake this parable unto certain 
which trusted in themselves that they were righteous and despised others. Two men went up into the temple to pray, the one a Pharisee, the other a publican. The Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself, God, I thank thee that I am not as other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even as this publican. I fast twice in the week. I give tithes of all that I possess. And the publican standing afar off would not lift up so much as his eyes unto heaven, but smote upon his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Yes. I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone that exalteth himself shall be abased, and he that humbleth himself shall be exalted. Father, bless this holy book now and give me the grace of God to preach it. Amen. Go ahead and be seated. This is a classic example, classic confrontation. And by the way, this house has both in it right now. We have both in here this morning. Sometimes folks don't realize uh, how they fit the category, but once the light of the Word of God and God's Spirit begins to move in your soul, if you'll listen to Him, He'll let you know what you are. When he, the spirit of truth, has come, he will guide the world into all truth. He referring to the Holy Spirit of God. And so the scripture which is God breathed is God's word which is alive. If you'll receive it this morning, you'll receive life into your soul that will begin to move and speak to you. Now the Bible says two men. The Lord's going to teach them something here. If the last verse in verse 14 says, one went down justified to his home, the other was not. The word justified is a legal term, simply means that he's no longer held accountable for any of the sins that he might have confessed. If I notice carefully, he didn't confess sins, he confessed to God what he was. And this is important to understand the text. The Bible said one was a Pharisee and the other a publican. They both went to the temple, they both saw the need to go to the temple of God. If you notice carefully, when the Pharisee entered the temple, he approached God in such a manner as to let the Lord know how that God was, was so privileged to have him stand in his presence that day. And if you notice that the Pharisee is thanking God for his righteousness, for his wonderful condition before the Lord. And the truth of the matter is, when you begin to observe it and make note of it, it looks more to me like a worship service than it does a real prayer meeting because he has come to praise God for who he was. And my friend, I'll tell you the problem in our churches today, and it should be obvious to every last one of you, that the emphasis for the last 50 years has been upon worship in this country and people are going to the church houses and they are worshiping and it makes no difference how they live, who they are, what kind of life they have. If they can find a church that'll make them feel good, then they have worshiped God. It's a problem here. This is the issue. Worship. The Bible tells me plainly that worship is an element that's produced only by the spirit of the living God. Worship. And so one worshiped and he worshiped and he praised God and he thanked the Lord for his condition. But the other one would not as so much as lift his head toward heaven, but smote his breast and said, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. This is important. For if we find this man not confessing sins that he had committed, though no doubt there were, because he called himself a sinner. But what he was doing was confessing what he was. And that's important because that's how you get close to God. That's how you approach him. You say, well, I thought if you confess this sin or confess that sin, that everything would be okay. No, confess who you are. And then you begin to understand what the issue is between you and the Lord. We're sinners. I've heard men say they're not. They're fooled. They live in self-deception. We are sinners. The Apostle, Paul, Apostle John says, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. If we say we have not sinned, we make God a liar. Tell that, put that in your heart and write it in your soul. The next time you hear a Pharisee stand up and tell you he or she does not sin. They are deluded. They live in la-la land. 
They live in a fairy world. They have no concept of holiness and righteousness and the presence of God. This man knew that he was coming before the Lord. He understood that. He understood that God was so much greater than he was. And so he said, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Have you ever prayed a prayer like that? Have you ever really come before God and confessed to God what you are? Not so much what you've done. What you do is a product of what you are. The issue is not so much the individual sins as it is the whole collective body of what you are. The Lord Jesus Christ said he came into this world to seek and save what? That's right. And that's what this is about this morning. So one prayed with himself and said, I thank thee. The other one said, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. The Pharisee had nothing to confess. The publican had nothing to repress. He was willing to open his soul and his spirit. Notice the lack of the mention of sin on the part of the Pharisee. Not a single word. He was above it. He had now reached the plateau of self-righteousness. But the problem is that the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? I don't know my heart. I think I do, but I do know this. I know I do believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. What about the heart, preacher? That is an issue of the Holy Spirit. David said, search me and try me and see if there be any wicked way in me. <laughs> the Hebrew word wicked means see if there be any falseness in my heart. If there is any deception in my heart that is leading me in the wrong way, even though I think I'm walking with God, for God, and to God. So my friend, it's not a simple thing. In the book of Psalm, chapter number 139 and verse 24, is where David said, if there be any wicked way in me. Now David knew what he was talking about. In the 51st Psalm, you know he talks about repentance. And this is probably the greatest Psalm in all the Bible to define what repentance is all about. You see, David knew what it was to be a sinner and he knew what it was to repent. You hear nothing about repentance in the churches today. You hear a lot about believe. You hear a lot about claiming. You hear a lot about approach. And you hear an awful lot about worship. You hear a lot about who you are and how great you are and how God wants to pour his blessing out upon you. And he wants to give you all these things. And look at our culture today. It is on a free fall down. Apparently, the churches have no effect whatsoever upon what goes around. The Bible said, we're the salt of the earth. We're the light of the world. Where's the light? Where's the salt? This church in this country is not doing anything to affect this. Say, what do you know? How, know? how do you know this preacher? Because they're closing down all over the place because of a plague. People are scared to death to come to church. They can go to work. They can go to Walmart. They can go everywhere in the world, but they can't come to church. Wake up! You live in la-la land. But it's an indication of what kind of shape our churches are in. People are scared to death. My friend, you better be scared of hell. You better be worried about where you're going. I'd fear, I'd fear the Almighty far more than I would a plague. You need to make your mind up. Do you really believe? Are you a real believer? Because you're being tried right now. And this is an indication. See, my dear friend, the plague didn't change the church. The plague didn't change anything about the church. The plague just revealed what the church was and what it was all about. It just showed. It's kind of like when they open, when they open the colors on the, on the ocean and show which side they're truly on. They show their colors. This is what's happened. Satan has made a joke out of it. He's laughed at it. The churches today are worshiping. They're worshiping. They're worshiping. They're worshiping. And I've heard one say one time a few years ago, that I, I was reading some kind of an email or something somewhere, and this woman was talking about the service that she'd had the day before. She'd visited with the church, and she said, we had quality worship. I thought to myself, that's it. Tell her, keep talking. <laughs> keep talking, because you've pulled the curtain back. Quality, sir, quality worship. Well, you know, we could do that. I guess we could pull, bring a clown in here and we could bring a band in here and we could, and we could, we could give out the, well, we could give out Budweiser and Blue Ribbon and Slits and, and Heineken and, and Jack Daniels and get them drunk and just stagger around all over the place and have a good old hoedown, couldn't we? 
That's what a lot of churches are doing today. They're having hoedowns. They, yeah, they are. But you see, my friend, you can get high on that junk and it'll drop you. You let the Holy Ghost fill you with the power of the Holy Spirit of God and it'll hold you up through the worst of times. Amen, amen, amen. You see, the Lord Jesus Christ, the power of the Holy Spirit of God has nothing to do with this whitewashed, namby-pamby, dead church today. That's what we need. Year after year, we schedule revivals and have the evangelists come in and everybody gets ready and they'll put their three days in and they'll have their revival. I was listening to an old man the other day and he says, talking about Sam Jones. Sam Jones was an old Methodist preacher, lived about 150 years ago. Old Sam Jones. I asked him, the man asked him, how come you didn't have an altar call tonight? And went the second day, how come Sam? I mean, what's going on? You're having no altar call. And he said something about the fact that he said, before I skin my pig, he said, I've got, to, I've got to heat him up and I've got to scrub him good. And what he's saying is that before I give an altar call, I want God's word to begin to work on your soul and on your spirit. And he preached two weeks before he gave the first altar call. He wasn't worried about some number on the wall back here where he could brag to somebody about how many had been saved. No, 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 no. He gave an altar call when the Holy Ghost of God began to move in that place. Do you know what? The truth of the matter is, let's just talk plain to this morning. I don't need to give you an altar call. That's a formality. That's a formality. What do you mean? When you hear the Word of God begins to move in your soul, get up <laughs> right then and come and pray and somebody will meet with you down in the altar. By the way, that's not the altar either. Let's just get technical. Do you want to? We have an altar that they know nothing of that served the tabernacle. We have an altar that's all, say, where's my altar preacher? Right there where you sit. If you want to make it an altar where you can pour your soul out to God, he'll meet you there. He'll meet you right there on the spot. So we don't preach repentance anymore because repentance demands a change of life. Churches today are half full of fornicators. They're shacked up today like it's no big deal. They stagger in drunk to the services. Hooked on dope and everything under the sun. Well, preacher, we ought to be gracious. We ought to, we ought to be kind to them. We ought to try to, yeah, we ought to try to help them. I agree, but agreeing with their lifestyle is not going to help them. You got to tell them the truth, folks. You got to tell them the truth because they don't repent. And until they repent, they're not right with God. And so he, in, for, 50, for seven days, when Nathan approached David about his son that he had illegitimately had with, had with Bathsheba, he said, your sin's going to be put away. You're not going to die, David, but the child is not going to live. And for the next seven days, David went into a room, lay on the dirt, and begged and pleaded with God for seven days for that child. He cried out to the Lord. I mean, he cried out to God. But the child died. The child died. And you know the story. You know the story. After the child had died, they came to David, and David had washed himself and cleansed himself and prepared himself and had gotten up off of the dirt. And they said, David... While your child was alive, you cried out to God. You cried out to him. You poured your heart and your soul out to him. Now the boy's dead, and you're acting like that it's everything's okay now. You cleanse yourself. David said, when I cried out to him, he was alive. God might have saved him. God might have given him life. Now he's gone. And so what I will do is he can't come to me, but I'll go to him. Amen. Amen. That's the great truth of repentance. You see, David writes some psalms while he's repenting. And these are good. Psalm chapter number six. O Lord, rebuke me not in thine anger. Neither chasten me in thy hot displeasure. Have mercy upon me, O Lord, for I am weak. O Lord, heal me, for my bones are vexed. My soul is also sore vexed. But thou, O Lord, how long? Return, O Lord, deliver my soul. O save me for, my mercy's sake, for thy mercy's sake. Then in Psalm 32, which is a classic on this, it says, When I kept silence, my bones waxed old through my roaring all the day long. For day and night thy hand was heavy upon me. My moisture is turned into the drought of summer, Selah. I acknowledge my sin unto thee, and mine iniquity have I not hid. I said, I will confess my transgressions unto the Lord, and thou forgavest the iniquity of my sin, Selah. 
cried out to God. You see, you don't realize what a deep pit that you're falling into if you're, if you're, if you're having an affair on your husband or your wife or if you're backsliding into a horrible condition. You might even be going into sodomy, homosexuality, every kind of a perversion under the sun. You might be going into it. Your kids right now may not know if they're male or female. The culture that you live in is a godless, wicked, pervert culture. Wake up, people. They'll destroy your children. They'll destroy them. They're out to destroy their very soul. A boy today doesn't know if he's a female or a male. A girl doesn't know if she's a female or a male. Where do you think that came from? That came straight out of the pit of hell. Well, I don't like it, preacher. Well, come to God with it. Amen. And come to God with it and bring your children to God. Yeah. But your children are going to have to see something in your life first yeah. that gives them a desire to want to come to the Lord. Amen. Children watch you. Yeah. They're listening to you. And that's called hypocrisy if you're holy on Sunday and the rest of the week you live like the devil. That's why you're losing your children. That's why they're losing. That's why the church is losing them. It's because you're not living the way you should be in front of them. I know what I'm preaching is hard this morning. I understand that. I've been at this a while. I realize that, but sometimes, you, as the old timer said, you need to be taken to the woodshed. Amen. Amen. You need to be taken to the woodshed. John S. Humphreys had a board that long. He was the principal of Rule High School. Long time ago. Bend over, he'd say. Me. Hold of the chair. You need to hold something because I'm going to knock you in the floor if you don't. And he'd come with that board and he'd whack me and you could hear the sound reverberating on the walls of rural high school. Oh, this godless crowd of devils today would put a man like that in jail. They'd prosecute him and lock him away. He was one of the best men that ever walked in Knoxville, Tennessee. Yes, he was. He was a good principal. He loved his kids. And since then, they've had... They've had a, Reunion after reunion after reunion, and they have John Humphreys right smack in the middle because they love him. They love him and he loves them. He's the kind of man we need. But you see this government? You see this culture? Spare the rod and spoil the child, the Bible says. They didn't go in schools and blow 10 year old kids away back then. You've done it your way, and we're paying dearly for it. Oh, yeah, you've done it your way, all right. You've created your own system, morality, and ethics, and the kids are paying dearly for it. Who takes the responsibility for those kids shot to death in Uvalde, Texas? Who does? Who takes that responsibility? You go back to Spock 30, 40 years ago, where he says, you don't beat on your children. Some kids, if they had the board laid to them like I had it laid to me, and my problem was I was kind of stubborn. He did more than once. <laughs> I thought you'd thought I'd learned after the first time. All right, let's go back to the office. <laughs> Here I go. <laughs> I knew exactly where to go. I knew exactly what to take hold of. I knew exactly how to bend over, and I knew exactly what was coming. You'd have thought I'd learned something, wouldn't you? <laughs> but that's okay. I love him and respect him. And I hope, uh, you know, I'd like to see that day come. I'd like to see the day come when this federal government and this, and this Caesar got his hands out of school and let you train up your children in the right way. Let them learn discipline early. Let them learn right and wrong. Let them become good citizens and it'll take the rod on some of them to do it. Some of these boys, if they had a good rod laid to them, they'd turn into good husbands and they'd be, they'd be the best thing that ever happened to them. Yeah, man. It'd be good. It'd be a good thing. <laughs> Uh, that's right. Hey, how many's ever had the rod laid on you in this house? Good night. I mean, I'm not the only sorry low down devil in here. <laughs> All right, boys, join the club. <laughs> you know exactly what I'm talking about. Now, I want to ask you a question. Do you hate the one that did that to you? You'll find 99% of the time, no, I love them because I needed it. And I needed it, and I needed it more than I got it. I started out on Beaumont Avenue with, with, uh, with, uh, with uh, what did you call it back then, uh, elementary school. 
getting the rod laid on me. That's stupid, you know it? <laughs> Amen. The only good thing about that rod, it wasn't quite as long as the one it ruled. This one was about like this. Of course, I wasn't but 10 years old either. And then as I got older, the rod got longer. Now, you know, the Lord does that to us when we're saved. But the rod is not a piece of wood. He said, those I love, I chasten. And I scourge every son that I receive. You see, just like I loved the principle that rule and, and for what he did for me, I love the Lord Jesus when he lays the rod on me. Now, you say, how he's going to lay the rod on you? You know. You know. Don't you? How many of you wiggling around, sneaking around? How many of you are living like that right now and you know it's not right? And you're trying to make excuses for it and hide from God. You're not smart if you think you can hide from God. All right, I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand, but how many in here know you need the rod laid on you? <laughs> you don't have to raise your hand because God will take care of the rod, but he'll do it in love. Those I love, I chasten, and I scourge every son that I receive. It does something, boy. It does something good for you. <laughs> it does. It does. Because it showed me that they not only cared for my education, but they cared for the development of my spirit and my soul and my character and who I was. And to this day, glory to God, bust my hind end more if I need it. That's my attitude toward it. Amen. How about you? Amen. 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 I want to give you two types of repentance and then I'll close this morning. One is found in Exodus chapter number 9, verse 25 where Pharaoh said, I've sinned. He said, I've sinned, all right? He said, I've sinned, but nothing changed because as soon as the circumstances changed, Pharaoh went right back to being Pharaoh. You ever met anybody like that? You ever met anybody run to the altar and they ought to, I full agree with it, but they, it, you know, they pour their soul out at peers, but then the minute things change, then they're out of church and they're back into where they came from and nothing's changed. You know why? Because they didn't repent. That's why. Because you see, the Apostle Paul said, Oh, wretched man that I am. Now, he's the man who wrote the New Testament, biggest part of it. You know what the word wretched means? Miserable. Miserable. I don't enjoy being miserable. Do you? I really don't. I don't enjoy being miserable. Well, preacher, I'm miserable. What can I do about it? Talk to the Lord. That's what you can do about it. Talk to him. Talk to him from your heart. The Apostle Paul quoted that in Romans chapter number 7. The Bible says that when Peter, Peter, Peter heard that cock crow the third time, the Bible said he went out and he wept bitterly. You ever been around Peter when he's weeping? I'm talking about the church house. People who come to the altar and pray. You ever been around Peter? You ever heard Peter pray? You ever heard, you ever heard Peter weep? You ever heard anybody pour their soul out? Folks, in all the years I've been at Temple, I've heard some prayers. <laughs> I mean, I've heard some souls pour themselves out before God. Yes, sir, buddy, and I'm going to tell you what happens. When they pour their soul out, and I mean they empty it, they hold nothing back, they talk to God, they get up from there and they turn around and there's joy. There's, there's glory on their face. They came in this house miserable, but they leave out of here with joy, unspeakable, and full of glory. That's what he has for you. That's where you ought to live. That's what, that's what you should have because the Bible says the joy of the Lord is your strength. So what do you, you know, you, ought to, you, you should know that. The joy of the Lord is your strength. And yet we are like Pharaoh one more night with the frogs. One more night with the frogs. Miserable. What is it that you're not willing to give up that's keeping you from walking with God. What is it? Is it that important? What is it? Every one of you have your own individual life. Every one of you. Don't compare yourself with somebody else. That's a big mistake. What is it in your life that you are not willing to give up that you think is more important than the joy of the Lord? Now you can hear a pen drop. Amen? Because I'm getting very pers personal with you. I am. I know I am. I'm talking straight to your soul. What is it? 
What is it in your life that's keeping you from the joy of the Lord? You say, am I going to go to hell? No, you don't go to hell for that. You go to hell for rejecting the light of Jesus Christ in your soul, and you say no to him. That's what sends a man to the pit. Jesus Christ, you either have him or you don't have him. But your sins separate you from God. I want to ask you, the truth of the matter is, I'm just the preacher. I can't do anything about your relationship with God. I can't make you closer to God. I can't, I can't bring you to God and say, here, Lord, I've, I've got them right now. Everything's done. Accept them. No, it's not. I can't do that. I can't do that. But I can preach the truth to you, Amen. just like I am right now. Is there anybody in this house this morning that's got something between you and the Lord? It may, not be a big, it may not be a bad thing so much as it is a thing that just simply consumes your life. And you don't have time to pray. You don't have time to read your Bible. You don't have time to fellowship with the Lord. You just don't have time for it anymore. And you wonder why you have no joy. Amen. That's sad, isn't it? You like being miserable? The Bible, you know, not the Bible, but the truth of the matter is from experience, misery loves company. If you're miserable in here today, you are probably burning up when you see somebody with joy and rejoicing in the Lord. It's probably making you so mad you could spit fire because they're half, they're in, they have joy and you're sitting here miserable. I'm going to tell you what you can do if we confess our sin. He's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That's all he requires of you. He doesn't require you to get on your hands and knees and crawl for half a mile. Doesn't require you to cut yourself and, and, and shed your blood. Doesn't, he doesn't require you to flagellate yourself as they do in some parts of the world. And that's not going to do anything. That's your own self-righteousness. The only thing that can get you right with God is the blood that was shed at Calvary, the cross of the Lord Jesus, the sacrifice that was made. Are you willing to accept that this morning? Bow your head with me. Father, Lord, you know that I preached simple, straight message about this. And Father, I believe, Heavenly Father, that this is like a cancer. It sucks the very joy and the power out of a church. And we're not immune to it. Not one bit. We've got the same problem here as all the rest of them have. And Father, I pray for every soul in the house. And I pray, Lord, that if they have something between them and you, that you'd give them the grace of God today to forsake it and turn from it and come to you and confess to you, confess to you, and then start afresh, start anew this morning, start in fellowship, start walking with the Lord again and watch the joy come back in their soul. They'll have a song in their heart. They'll have peace in Jesus' name. For Jesus' sake, I pray. Amen. I found this before I came to church. It's a good old song. It's one of that I love. It's been around a long time. There's a land beyond the river that we call the sweet forever. And we only reach that shore by faith's decree. One by one we'll gain the portals there to dwell with the immortals when they ring the golden bells for you and me. We shall know no sin nor sorrow in that haven of tomorrow when our bark shall sail beyond the silver sea. We shall only know the blessing of our Father's sweet caressing when they ring the golden bells for you and me. When our days shall know their number, when in death we sweetly slumber, when the King commands the Spirit to be free, Nevermore with anguish laden we shall reach that lovely Aden when they ring the golden bells for you and me. Don't you hear the bells now ringing? Don't you hear the angels singing? Tis the glory, hallelujah, jubilee in the far off sweet forever just beyond the, the shining river when they ring those golden bells for you and me. Oh, what a beautiful song. When you hear them bells ringing again, won't you hear them ringing? Do you hear the angels singing? Won't take anything for that. Would you like to come down here and do something about it? Just come down and pray. Let's stand up. Brother, what we got here? 382 in the All-American Church hymnal, softly and tenderly. Softly and tenderly, Jesus is calling, calling for you and for me. See on the portals, he's waiting and 
this I've learned from the Lord. You take the first step and he'll take the rest of it. You take the first step, he'll take you by the hand. He'll lead you right where you need to be. Amen. God does not play with us. He doesn't expect you to come to him and try to find the way. Just make that step toward the Lord. He'll take the rest of it. Jesus is calling, calling, oh sinner, come home. Come home, come home, come home. Why should we tarry when Jesus is pleading, pleading for you and for me? Why? definition of child abuse is for you to use a rod a stick or something you know a, 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 a board switch yeah to 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 chasten your child to train them okay now that is child abuse in the mind of this pervert generation but a sodomite Mercy. can be standing within 10 feet of a 10 year old boy naked mm. yeah Naked, naked in front of that boy. And there's a photograph, classic one of the thing. The boy just, he doesn't know what to do. His, he just, his face is just torn all to pieces. And that's okay. You see, that's okay with this generation. That's all right. That's not child abuse to them. Are you, are you, are we getting anywhere this morning? Yeah. Amen, folks. That's right. He never will, brother. For the rest of his life. Oh, yeah. Yes, I agree with you, brother. I'm same boat. I'm just sick to death and fed up with them. Yes, sir. Yes, sir, I'm tired of their standards and their ethics and their morality Amen. and their perversion of the truth and they're calling evil good and good evil. Yes, it does. Yes, they do. Yes, they do. No, oh, it'll get worse. Oh, yeah, it'll get worse. Yes. 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 Yes, and we have to preach this. Amen. We have to we have to preach it. We got to stand for the truth, folks. If we can't do this, then then forget it. We we live in a we we live in a we live in a we live in a pervert sodomite country, and uh, and uh, it's over. Father, bless your word. Thank you for the time we have together. And Lord, may your word go forth for the purpose you intended. Lord, it's, I don't know what purpose it is, but you do. You do. You know what's going to happen with it. And you know how every soul in this house will receive it today or reject it. In Jesus' name.